everyone, and welcome to the GI Jobs Get Hard Workshop. Um, I'm Rachel Pitts. I'm going to be moderating today, and um, welcome to uh, an awesome instruction guide on how to get hired. Um, so this is in preparation for our virtual job fair next week. We're going to um, have two amazing women speaking about uh, recruiters' tips and tricks and how to get hired and connect with those employers. So um, first, I'm going to introduce um, Cassie Hart. She's a senior talent sourcing specialist, um, say that three times fast, for Wells Fargo. Um, she is amazing. She's been working with the Veteran Service, Service Organization, uh, part of Wells Fargo, and I will let her say hello. Welcome, Cassie. Wonderful. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. I am excited to connect with you today. All right, and we also have Leslie Coffey. Um, she is the Vice President of Military Engagement for American Corporate Partners. Um, and she's also a military spouse of 26 years to a soldier. And she, I think, I'm pretty sure, has the Guinness record for volunteering and professional awards <laughs> given to one person. Um, there's definitely too many to mention, um, but she is a very talented individual. Um, Leslie, please say hello. Thank you, Rachel. I'm excited to be here as well as uh, I, I was also a recruiter, so I can kind of speak on that hat, even though that's not my current hat. But I'm really proud and uh, happy to be here today. Yes, thank you. All right, um, so the way that this is gonna go today is we're gonna have um, kind of part one and part two. Um, part one is gonna cover prepping for um, a job interview, basically what you should do in advance, then we'll have a brief intermission, and I'll show everyone how to um, sign up for our job fair, where to go. Um, and throughout the presentation, part two will be um, what to do in the actual interview. Um, and then throughout the presentation, we're going to be dropping some links in the chat so you guys can um, follow along and have those resources. Okay, let's jump right in. So um, let's start with prepping for the job fair. Um, what advantage does submitting a resume in advance give to a military job seeker? What would you say, Leslie? So you always want to do your research um, and definitely you want to research the roles, you want to research the culture, you want to research their mission. And that way you can be prepared prior to going in because oftentimes there's so many employers and you have limited time. You want to make sure that, you know, prioritize who you're reaching out to and uh, make sure you're aligned with their mission. Yes, yes, definitely. That is. Um a huge part of resume building is connecting. Um, oh my goodness, what is that word? Making it specific to that employer. Sorry, thank you. Um, yeah, and giving it to them in advance definitely gives them an opportunity to check it out prior to, like get an idea of who you are before they um, sit down with you. All right, um, let's see. Uh, Kathy, what common mistakes do you often see on resumes from transitioning service members? And veterans. Sure. So what I see most often is that a transitioning service member, even a military spouse, really downgrade the advantages and all of the transferable skills that they bring. And so it's very important to make sure that even if you're not someone that likes to brag about yourself, and most of us aren't, that your resume is a place where you want to brag about everything that you do, everything that you've done, and what you can bring to the table, because your resume is really your ticket to play and you want to bring your best foot forward each and every time. Yes, absolutely. Not the time to be humble. All right, thank you. Um, and anything, what about military spouses? About 20% of our um, audience that attends the job fairs are, are military spouses. So have you seen any common mistakes on their resumes? A lot of times we'll see that military spouses are hesitant to talk about the gaps in their resume. And those gaps are important because you're doing something like moving all the way across the country three times a year or, you know, taking care of your family. And so addressing those gaps is important. And also don't downplay volunteerism. Because on military spouse resumes, we'll see a lot of times that they volunteer and that you learn a ton of skills in those areas. And so making sure that you put those on there to ensure that we understand, you know, what you did, you managed a huge budget, you made sure that everyone is where they were supposed to be. Those are skills that we definitely want to bring to the hiring managers and recruiters. For sure. Yeah, thank you. All right. Um, and we already touched on this um, a little bit before um, with Leslie's 
response, but how important is it for a resume to be tailored to each position you're applying for? So not only the company, but um, can you go a little bit more in detail about each position? Absolutely. So I would say this is a critical step. And if it's missed, you will not move forward in the interview process. Some companies have an ATS system or an IA system, AI excuse me, system that will look at your resume and look for keywords. Um, Wells Fargo specifically does not have this, but we do look at every single resume to ensure that you're looking at the required and desired qualifications. And sometimes they're all preferred and non-preferred depending upon the company that you're applying with. And if you do not meet those qualifications in your resume, and it's not 100% clear, you will not move forward. So do not skip this step. It is absolutely critical to your success. Agreed. Um, yeah, and Leslie, is there anything you'd like to expand on? You know, I'd love to go back and just highlight what Cassie was talking about briefly with volunteerism. So often spouses downplay the importance of that and, you know, experience is experience. It doesn't matter if you're getting paid for it or not. So please don't undersell yourself, sell yourself short with that experience. As far as tailoring, crucial. Companies want to know why that role, why you're a great fit for that specific role. I understand that that is, uh, you know, really time consuming and it can be a long, arduous process, but that is why it's so important to make sure you're narrowing your scope and really understanding the exact career path that you want to go down to, because you don't want to be in a position where you're just spraying and praying and you're using the same resume for 200 positions. It's more important to have a lot of conversations, potentially, you know, a mentor to help you to identify what's the best path for you and your skills. Um, and then you can just hone in on tailoring to that path as opposed to just trying to uh, blanket in, in that situation, you're, you're just not gonna, um, you're just not gonna move forward like Cassie was saying. 100%, yes. In fact, you probably save time by doing it this way and getting hired faster than just ongoing, you know, waiting for a job that is probably never gonna come unless you fix your resume. Um, so great point. Uh, and one thing that I would suggest people do is look at the job description and find what you have that matches that job description and highlight that in your resume. Take those key terms from the description and put it in your resume. Not copy and paste, obviously. You want to make sure that it's a reflection of you and your skills, but um, as, as closely as you can match it as possible is a great place to start. And, um, and, and 100%. Honestly, you know, women in general, not just spouses, but women veterans, women in general, they tend to want to match almost 100% of the job description. That's like their ideal unicorn candidate. You, where men, oftentimes they might hit 40% and they'll apply for it, they'll go for it. Women do the same, do the same, go for the position, don't self-select out, even if you don't meet 100% of the requirements. Oh, for sure, yeah. Because a lot of those skills are transferable and you can learn a majority of um, what required yeah all right um so on that same topic would either of you require or would either of you suggest um a professional resume writer uh, for any of our audience i wouldn't i don't want to say don't however there are a ton of great free veteran service organizations that can help you with that um, leslie talked about having a mentor a mentor is a great person to run that through and then some companies will have military talent liaisons like Wells Fargo that can help you tailor your resume specifically for that company. So do your research on the company and see if there's somebody there that can give you some insight into what that looks like and what where our recruiters are specifically looking for because every company is different. All the jargon can be different even from bank to bank. So I wouldn't say no, but I would be very cautious when it comes to paying for that service when there are a lot of individuals who will help you with that and do a great job for free. Agree, yeah. Um, and we just dropped a link into the chat for everyone um, for a service that does, it's topresume.com. They provide free resume um, feedback and assistance. So that's something you can start with. All right, um, so Leslie, what about a mentor? We've mentioned mentors. Some people aren't even really sure what, what that relationship is. Mm -hmm. um, but ACEP offers free mentorship in, uh, to transitioning service members. Um, and do you also, 
um, provide services for military spouses? Yes, so our services are completely free nationwide nonprofit, and we're eligible to anybody that has served at least 180 days post 9-11. So even if they got out 20 years ago, we're happy to um, help as well as transitioning service members, active duty military spouses, gold star spouses, and spouses of disabled post 9-11 veterans. Um, we are a nonprofit, completely grant funded, so you know those are the parameters of the grant. That's amazing. Yeah, so um what does a mentor offer? So a mentor is somebody in our, in our program, it's completely customized. It's a one-to-one -one basis. So you're provided with, um, you know, where you're offered a mentor that is a career professional in that space you're looking to get into. But even if you're undecided, because we talked about that earlier, uh, still, we can help you to figure that out. And, you know, what we have found with the help of our mentors a year later after landing that first job, 85% are still in that same position a year later. That's even with the great resignation, just keeping him, you know, thoughts of this past year and what's gone on. And the mentor, what they help you do is they see skills within you that you may not see within yourself that are transferable. Um, they help you to speak a language like Cassie was talking about, every company's different. Speak the language in that industry that's relevant for you to be marketable. And then they also help you to not only identify the right path, but what level should you be entering? You've got this experience, perhaps you've got certifications, education, what's the right level? And then of course, culture. So when you have that trifecta and the mentor helping you to identify that, that is meaningful employment. And that's exactly what we have seen. So that, um, that mentor can help you to discover all that and more about yourself. Wow, that's amazing. Um... Yeah, it kind of goes back to putting in the time to get the right resume written out. It's putting in the time to find the right company and the right fit for you. Um, yeah, that's really great. Um, okay, so same with the resume theme. Are cover letters still a thing or are they just totally out of date? What do you think, Kathy? I think they're kind of hit and miss. I don't think it's bad to have a cover letter, but I know that there's a lot of recruiting managers and recruiters and hiring managers that don't necessarily read them because of the amount of volume that we get. So the higher the level position that you're applying for, I'd say the more relevant a cover letter would become because the pool of candidates will be a lot smaller for you know, a CFO position than it would be for an entry point into any company. And um, for, for my company specifically, a cover letter is what lands you an interview. So it's really important in mind. But whenever I'm sharing an opportunity, I always stress that, like the cover letter lands the interview. But for transition service members, I think it's a great opportunity where you can talk about your window of availability and really share a little bit more of your journey and why that company, it's all about them, right? Why you're interested in that company and not a different company, why that position. So always start with your why in a cover letter and, and tell your story. Oh, for sure. I'm, I'm very pro cover letter. I like to tell my story. I don't like being boxed into just my skills and education and the dates and everything. I want to show my personality more so. Um, yeah, so. That's really good advice, but I definitely agree, Kathy, those entry level positions really don't, you don't need one, um, but they could also um, help to explain gaps in employment too. So, yeah. You know, All right. you need them uh, not, so definitely take advantage of it if you have the ability. And if they do, fantastic. And if they don't, it was the perfect. Exactly. Yeah. And it would be a lot easier to customize your cover letter versus to um, each position and each, it would really just be per company, a little bit of position, but you wouldn't have to change it quite so much as you would if you were um, as the actual resume part. But, awesome. All right, um, so talking about gaps, what would you recommend to overcome time gaps for resumes for military spouses and veterans who found unemployment since EASing? We talked a little bit about volunteering, but if they don't have volunteering or, um, yeah, how can they, address those gaps or overcome those? 
So a mentor can help with that as well. Um, but one thing is you can do is you can show what you're working on. If you're working on, even if it's, it doesn't have to necessarily be a certification, but even if it's any kind of credential, maybe a Google cert or something like that, anything that shows that you're hungry, you're interested in getting in the space, that you're working to better yourself with professional development as you're continuing to search. I would definitely recommend adding all of that in. Yeah, that's a great idea because there's so many free certifications like Google, HubSpot, all the, you know, you can just do a quick search for a lot of them. They're actual qualifications so, and certifications rather. Cassie, sorry, did you have something to add? I, did, I would address the elephant in the room. I think that sometimes we'll see veterans and military spouses tiptoe around that during interviews. And we want to make sure that you can just say, you know what, I took three months off. I had 20 years in the military and I wanted a break. And that's okay. Um, so definitely address that whenever or if you get the opportunity to speak to a recruiter and it'll make perfect sense to them once they understand the why behind it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, a well-deserved three months, that would be for sure. All right. Um, so what research should a military job seeker um, do about a company in advance? And what should they know about the company and the careers they offer? to military job seekers. Do you want to take that one, Kathy, or start off? Sure. So definitely learn about the culture. Not every company, even within the same industry, has the same culture. So make sure that it's something that you're interested in and it fits you and your values. Also, specifically for veterans and military spouses, understand what their culture is when it comes to military and to their veterans and military spouses. Some have specific programs. Um, and some are not considered military friendly. They're not, you know, on a specific list or they don't have a program specifically for that. So if that's something that's important to you, that really needs to be something that you look into. And I would very highly suggest getting a mentor from ACP prior to applying for those jobs and see, you know, if there's a company you're very, very interested in, let them know and they can connect you with someone that works with that company if they're a partner, because it's important to know what the day-to-day -day looks like. Um, as a military recruiter, I'll tell you all the great stuff about Wells Fargo. I'll tell you a little bit about the bad stuff, but I'm not in the trenches, let's say, in our risk department. So if you have somebody that can tell you everything about their day, the good, the bad, and the ugly, then you can make a very informed decision about if that's something that you want to pursue. Absolutely. Um, and when you say culture, where would you recommend starting for someone to look? You know, the culture of something in the Google search or where would where would someone go to find that? I think that looking at the company's website, they'll usually have their values listed there, but also reaching out to other veteran employees on LinkedIn and asking them, what's it like to work there? What's it like to be part of GI Jobs? Or what's it like to be part of Wells Fargo? And most of the time people will be pretty honest and let you know, hey, we have, you know, this is this is great, but then there's also this part that's maybe not so great about our company, and then you can weigh the pros and cons. Yeah, I like that a lot. Um, and yeah, um, a lot of, so also militaryfriendly.com is um, a part of GI Jobs, or we're part of them, we're, <laughs> we're one thing. Um, and so that lists military-friendly employers by several different designations, so that's a, fun, a, a good place to start. Um, and then a lot of websites will have uh, veteran or military specific pages on their career pages. Um, so highlighting those benefits. Yeah, so that's exactly right. Um, and you mentioned reaching out to people. Um, Leslie, could the mentor, the ACP mentors, can they set up um, information interviews? Yes. So actually, um, in addition to what we do with the one to one customized mentor, you, you know, once maybe you may narrowed that scope and you went from like, thinking of a few different industries, so your mentors got you figured out and you know this is one specific type of position. We have plenty of mentors in our pool that are willing to do one-off conversations. And at ACP, you're assigned a point of contact that is there with you throughout the whole process and they check in every month. So that's one of the things you just let that point of contact know. You just say, you know, hey, I, I'd like to speak to more people in in this type of career path, and then they'll uh, set those up for you. Can set as many as you like. So that's really cool. Um, that's super good to know. Yeah. Um, and can you expand on what an actual information interview is? 
in case people aren't aware? So it's really just learning more about what the day-to-day -day looks like. Like Cassie was saying, the good, bad, the ugly. Uh, what does day in life look like? Maybe, you know, out of all the different things throughout the day that you do, what percentage of time is spent in meetings? What percentage of time is spent in emails or, or whatever it is, right? Uh, and then perhaps you're like, I'm not too much on Zoom and being on camera and whatnot. I prefer to be more behind the scenes and maybe I, I just want to be on the computer. Learning all of those things, the day-to-day -day, and then also the different uh, VRGs, the veteran resource groups within the companies, what they do, if they have opportunities to volunteer. For example, if their company uh, supports that and, and really just how in depth are the values uh, within that company or if it's just word speak on, on the website, you know, having those conversations in, uh, can really open the, open your eyes to what it's like because you want to make, you don't want to transition twice or over and over and over again. So just like you were saying with the time saver, yes, it's a little bit of investment up front. But at the end, uh, you know, if you can maintain that great position uh, over a few years, then, and you know, if it's a better fit, then you're ultimately going to save your uh, time and then also your ability to, to uh, go up the ladder. Awesome. Thank you. Um, that's a great explanation. Um, all right. Uh, so talking about the virtual job fair that we have coming up next week, would you both recommend or not um, that the job seekers actually apply for a position prior to the job fair? Or would that give them any leg up or not? Is it worth the time? Kathy? So both, I think. Some of our positions and in other companies, they close very quickly. So you'll see a position come up and five days later, it's gone. If it's the perfect position for someone, don't wait for the job there because you won't get that job, you know, the opportunity to apply again. Some companies that will be there, um, and I'll use Wells Fargo as an example, will have a team of recruiters that can help you tailor your resume prior to applying. So if you're not in an extreme hurry and you have the ability to wait for one of our military talent liaisons to connect with you, and help you to tailor that resume like we've been talking about prior to applying for the role and learning a little more about you so they can advocate on your behalf with the manager and the recruiter. That would be my first choice. But again, don't not apply just to wait and then the opportunity be gone. And I'm sure there's a lot of other companies that would have the same situation. Okay, yeah, great advice. I didn't even think about the, the closing of the positions that would be so quick. Yeah, that's a good point. Anything to add to that, Leslie? No, I would just say that, you know, when you submit your resume in advance of the job fair, um, the companies have the ability to look at it in advance and maybe invite you to their room to have a conversation. Um, so we go through it and with the platform, we're able to, to do a filter in advance. And that might also save you some time because it's limited with how many booths and having really in-depth conversations. So it, it doesn't hurt, how about that, to submit your resume in advance. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so we have a question from an audience member um, and Dexter's asking if he's used an ACP mentor in the past, can he request a new one or is there a limit? So I guess it would really depend, first of all, how much time did you, did you complete an entire mentorship or did life happen? Um, you know, you're three months in and life happens. We understand that. Either way, the best way for us is an individual basis. Email us at info at acp-usa.org and I can put that in the chat. But, and we would love to talk to you on a case-by-case -case basis. Sometimes it's pivoting. Happy to help if you're pivoting and you're, you know, decide to go in a new direction, or perhaps you became alumni four years ago, and you know, and you're looking for uh, to really um, excel in a new path. We can have that conversation. So I'll put the email in the chat, and just speaking with you on an individual basis is the best way to determine. Okay, great, thanks. Um, all right, um, so I am going to share my screen now and then I'm going to show everybody how to uh, register for our virtual career expo. So, or virtual job fair, sorry, virtual job fair now. Um, all right. Okay, can you guys see that? 
Okay, awesome. So the first place you're going to go to is gijobs.com. You could go directly to gijobs.com slash get hired, um, get dash hired, and then you're going to click on the virtual job fair. So you're already here at the Get Hired Workshop, but um, the virtual job fair is the ultimate goal. And you're going to click on reserve your ticket. And it's going to bring you here to this page, which has a nice countdown to tell you how long uh, we have until the start of the event. And then you're going to um, click on reserve your ticket again. And it's going to bring you here to the um, Brazen platform where you can either sign up if you've never attended an event before, or you can log in. And um, fun fact about me, I was actually hired through this virtual job fair. Um, and we just recently hired another employee through the, the job fair as well. So it's definitely a great place to connect uh, military spouses like myself and veterans um, to career opportunity. And then once you get in, uh, there's a registration field, uh, um, several registration fields that you'll need to fill in. The more you complete, the better. Let me make this a little bit bigger for you guys. Uh, the more you complete, the better, because as um, Kathy and Leslie mentioned, the recruiters from the companies have access to view all of the candidate information prior to and during the event and even after the event. Um, so you want to make sure that every single field is completed in some way, that you have a resume file uploaded. Um, I highly suggest the LinkedIn profile be linked here and that you've done some um some uh cleaning up of your LinkedIn, scooping up, you know, making it uh, very complete as well. Um your education, all these things that need to be completed, um, branch of service, affiliation, um, all these things. If you wanted to put in your MOS code for veterans, you can. Um security clearance is big. I do not have one, but a lot of our uh, employers are looking for people with a security clearance. So if you have one, please indicate which one it is on here. If you're interested in furthering your education or if you are um, uh, oh, it's, uh, interested in franchise opportunities, that's on here too. Any certifications or licenses you'd like to add, if you want to um, self-identify of your veteran status, you can here. And then um, you can also put in a phone number. So once you've got your registration all completed, you can um, add, the, add the event to your calendar, and then you are already as able to access the event. So you can come in. The recruiters are not there yet. That doesn't happen until um, next week. But you can go in, and this is where you can get a sneak peek at the actual um, employers and what it is that they have to offer. So we've got um, the Federal Bureau of Prisons, Ashley Furniture, all different kinds of employers, all different kinds of industries. You can enter those and, oh, and there's Wells Fargo here. Let me just come and click on that one. <laughs> um, so you can enter the, their lobby and then um, see their opportunities. So these specific opportunities, a lot of our employers will list their high priority uh, opportunities and it'll take you straight to their um, application site. So you can put in that application prior to, oh, it looks like that one's already been hired. So we'll get that updated before next week. Um, but it will take you straight to their careers page where you can put in your application prior to if you're in a hurry, or if not, then um, you can, like Cassie suggested, wait and speak with a recruiter who can help you customize your resume um, specifically to that position. Um, yeah, so and you can make yourself familiar with all these. On the side bar here, we have that top resume um, link listed for you to um, get assistance with your resume. Um, and it does take up to 48 hours, so um, make sure that you get that in this week before next week so you're fully prepared for the event. Um, other than that, it's very simple. Um, once the event actually starts, then you will um, you'll be you can enter a booth and then right around here where my cursor is, there's going to be a big green chat button. And um, once you've looked at the company, checked out their opportunities, um, and you're ready to speak with a recruiter, then you'll click on that chat button and you'll be instantly connected with the recruiter. Um, and it will be either a text, like a chat conversation, or they may invite you up onto a video um, conversation. It's not an official interview. It's still just a, an informal chat, um, but it is uh, something that you should be prepared for. Um, I would not suggest blindly initiating a chat with a recruiter. You don't ever want to have the first sentence be high, what positions do you have available? 
that looks very unprofessional, unprepared. I've seen it happen. It's like watching a train wreck. You're like, really? Just go, just go. <laughs> so <laughs> just go back to um, the start and look at the job position. So you really want to make yourself prepared before you initiate that chat, um, which you can do in advance. So you have um, access to the lobby as soon as you register and you can come in and look at all these um, opportunities. You can um, go to their website and do all the research that you want. There's our ACP booth, and you can sign up for mentorship and learn more about them here. But yeah, so it's pretty simple. Um, you can edit your registration fields at any time. And then after the event, you can go back to your history tab. There's nothing here now. But after the event, it'll have a transcript of all text chats that you conducted. It won't have a transcript of the video chats, but it will show you which recruiter you spoke to. And then after each chat, um, both the recruiter and the candidates will have an opportunity to write out notes for themselves um, for reviewing after the event. You don't get to see, neither party gets to see the other party's information. So the recruiter notes are state, you know, on that side, the candidate notes are on that side. So if you get somebody who's rude and you say that they're a jerk, they'll never know. So you're all good, <laughs> which hopefully I don't anticipate that happening. But yeah, so that is how you um, join our uh, virtual job fair. Yeah. All right. I think I'm done sharing my screen. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's jump into part two. So, um, send the registration field, LinkedIn profiles. Um, would either of you like to jump in and talk about how important it is to have a LinkedIn profile? Leslie? Well, yes. Yeah. So first of all, if you're not on LinkedIn, the recruiters can't find you because they have a special tool that's called LinkedIn Recruiter and they can build projects and they can be based off of certain things, whether it's location, skills, education. Um, you know, they can even tell if you're following them or not or if you're active on LinkedIn. So although it's helpful to have a profile, it's even more uh, helpful if you at least log in, you know, a few times a week, comment, uh, you know, give a thumbs up. You can follow up to 500 companies, so you're not going to run out potentially. <laughs> um, so definitely do that. But just know, first step, if you're not there, then they're not going to find you because like over 90% of employers start with LinkedIn for sourcing talent. Yeah, that's great. And um, also, if you don't have a LinkedIn profile, you wouldn't be able to reach out and connect with employees to um, ask for that information interview or just ask for, you know, culture information, more of the stuff the day to day. Anything to add, Kathy? I would agree with everything Leslie said. It's where we look for you. So if you're not there, we can't find you. But also make sure that your LinkedIn profile is professional. Um, if you, there are a lot of different veteran service organizations that will do free headshots. So take advantage of that, have a very professional headshot. Um, jokingly, sometimes you'll see, you know, somebody with their cat in the car and they take a selfie or a bathroom selfie. Try not to put those types of things on LinkedIn. Those can be for other social media platforms. But we do look at LinkedIn. We use it for sourcing. And I know a lot of other companies do as well. And so just make yourself out there and it should technically reflect your resume, right? You have a place where you can put in your experience and it pulls keywords from LinkedIn Recruiter. Um, as Leslie said, we look at things such as location, but we also, if we're looking for somebody that has SQL experience, we use that as a keyword. And so if you have that experience, but it's not in your LinkedIn profile, again, we won't be able to find you. So it's very important that your resume be reflective or vice versa of your LinkedIn profile. Awesome. Yeah, that's, that's really great information. Um, so the recruiters are out there and they are looking on LinkedIn. Yeah, mm -hmm. and definitely, I mean, I would appreciate a picture with a cat in the background, but recruiters, yeah. not so much. <laughs> that's it for Facebook. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's just really important to have some type of a picture. Um, don't do a selfie because you just can't get the angle right. You know, just have a, a friend or a partner or somebody take a take a nice um, like, like shoulder up image. But in Portraits for Patriots is is a phenomenal place that will do uh, professional headshots for you for free. But don't wait 
for a professional headshot to put a picture. And the reason I share that is because there are, they exist, but only they, bots do exist on LinkedIn. So that is, this identifies that you are a real person and um, you know, you're like 20 times to more likely to connect with you if you have a, if you have a picture as opposed to if you don't. So I would rather you have a place card holder and, and have something that your friend just took with your phone that is uh, professional and maybe show up up. And the reason why you want it so close is because most of us do use our app. And so if it's far away, it's really tiny, it's hard to see you. Uh, but And then it, have that while you're booking your session with Fortress Patriots. Fortress for Patriots. Yeah, yeah, that's a great organization. And that's really cool to say off of that. Um, um, okay, so let's talk about once they're at the fair. Um, so they've researched the top companies they want to talk to. They've researched the roles, perhaps, and maybe even applied for them. Um, so let's, in the event that they get called up on video, it's not an interview, but what would you suggest that they wear for the um, event? Business Kathy? professional, I would say definitely not a t-shirt. Uh, so be camera ready. Do not be in a place where, or blur your background, one or the other. Um, we've had sometimes people pop up and you can tell they're laying in bed or, you know, sitting back in their bed and you're like, oh, um, so be in a, in a place where you can show your background or put up a virtual background if that's what you have or blur your background um, and make sure that, you know, you're in a quiet spot where there's not a lot of distraction in the background. Starbucks probably isn't the best place to do a video interview or a video chat with someone. Um, and just make sure that you treat it as if you're face to face with someone, because now in our current environment in our virtual world, this is our face to face. Right? I live in a very rural community and I work at home remotely and I see my colleagues once a year. So this is my face to face with other adults and you have to make sure you're professional. Yeah, definitely agree. Anything to add, Leslie? Yes, I concur. Everything that Cassie said, and you know, I even had an interview one time where they were vaping, and so just be professional. And, and so you want to um, make sure that it's also, you know, it's even more than than portraying the role that you want to be. You want to be comfortable, so you don't have to be like all suit and tie and everything because you do want to be comfortable. However, be presentable, um, look professional, and it's all about a mindset too. You want to, if you're in, you know, pajamas or gym clothes or something like that, then you're going to be in that mindset. So you're entering a professional environment where this might be the one opportunity to make that first impression and make that first impression lasting. So you want it to be a positive one. You want to be remembered for the right reasons and not the wrong reasons. Yes, I love that. Remembered for the right reasons, for sure. Um, awesome. Okay. So um, now they've entered the booth and what should their introduction or opening question look like? We definitely know it not it should not be what do you have, what positions are available? Uh, what would you suggest is a good icebreaker or opening? Kathy, sir. I always appreciate when they come in with just a hi, how are you? You know, get to know them a little bit, tell tells where you live, where you're interested in being. I think location is important for a lot of companies, so they'll appreciate to know, do you live in California? Are you in North Carolina? And what are you interested in? So you can say, you know, I'm focusing on the IT field. That way we know, oh, okay, now my IT brain comes on and this is the recruiter I need to get them to, or these are the positions that I have available. Okay, yeah, that's all great. Yeah, it, um, especially for transitioning veterans um, and military spouses, you could be moving. So you might not be in a location where you might want not be looking for a job where you currently are. You're looking for one at your next place. So yeah, that's really uh, a good observation. Um, how about you, Leslie? What would you so say? I, would the say I know there's um, a lot of conversations about remote opportunities and although in location still matters even for remote positions. And I'll tell you this because not every, not all employers are registered for taxes and unemployment and things like that in every state. So even if it is a virtual or remote or hybrid opportunity, um, knowing your location is helpful because sometimes they may they may not be a registered employment in, employer in your state. So you still want to share that even if you're looking for a remote position. 
And definitely like the more you can give us information or, or tell us that you've done your homework in advance, then again, it's that whole being remembered for the right reasons. Yes, yes. And location is also important for time zones. Uh, for example, I'm in Central Time and I work on East Coast Time. So it's really nice that I'm done for the day at four o'clock, but I still have to put in, you know, my hour. So I start at seven um, working on East Coast Time. So that's something to consider. You might not want to work for a company on, say, from the East Coast if you're on the West Coast, because so that would be some very early mornings for you, unless they would be open to flexing those hours. So definitely something to consider. Um, and as a side note, these conversations are limited to 10 minutes. They can be extended if it's a very productive conversation by the recruiter, um, but essentially they, they want to have as many conversations as possible. So if it's not extended, don't be offended. It's just that they're, um, you know, maybe you're great and we want to interview you or this isn't a fit or not. Um, but being that it is such a short get to know you period, um, what would you recommend they include in like an elevator speech is what it's called? What would you say the top three uh, things to include in their introduction of themselves would be? Three or five, whatever. <laughs> Kathy? So I would like to hear when they come into the room what they're interested in. It doesn't have to be a job specifically, but do they enjoy working with customers face to face or would they rather be someone in the, the back end doing work, you know, where people can't? really interact with them on a daily basis. So that's important so that we can start to determine, okay, which positions would fit well if they have done their homework and identified some positions that they're interested in. That would be great too, because then we can narrow it even further. Um, their availability is also very important. Are they transitioning next week or are they transitioning in two years? That will steer the conversation in a slightly different way. And then any questions that they have about the company, that's always a great way to get to know the culture and the recruiters and really what the expectations are around um, how we can help them. Great. Anything to add to that, Leslie? No, I think that's all on point. I would just uh, maybe, it doesn't hurt to reiterate what you're passionate about. If you're seeking a certain position, what really motivates you, what drives you, um, because well, for my organization, I can speak uh, specifically for my my cause is a nonprofit, and so we can we can teach you processes and 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 tools and things like that. We can't teach passion. That's internal. So uh, you know, if something is really interested in you and lights your fire, let us know. Uh, any company, let them know if their mission drives you, if that specific position, like, oh man, this is like a love labor. I would love this opportunity. Can we talk more? Then let us know that off the front too. Yeah. And that's definitely something that they can prepare in advance by looking at the companies and having that, um, you know, maybe a notepad, like ACP, I'm excited to learn about this. Well, it's not for hiring, it's for mentoring, but uh, Wells Fargo, this position sparks my fire, you know, and yeah, that's something that they can prepare in advance. All right, so um, and go ahead. One more thing for that, Rachel, is at, make sure to ask recruiters what the follow-up process looks like. Should you reach out to them? Should you be expecting them to reach out to you? If so, what's the timeline? Also asking what the timeline is for their hiring process. Some companies, I know Amazon moves extremely quick. So they're like, nope, you'll get through this and you'll be contacted within five days. Other companies may say, you know, it'll be a 90 day process so that you personally can plan and know what your timeline looks like if you have a specific start date in mind. Yeah, that's, that's great insight. Sure. Um, so in the booth, um, speaking from the recruiter standpoint, how likely are you to call up a candidate on video and what would prompt that? Kathy? So we are not allowed to talk to people on video during Brazen, so you won't see any of us, I'm sorry. <laughs> however, however, um, if we follow up with you afterward, if you join our booth and you would like to have a face-to-face -face conversation, then we can schedule that using a different platform. But for us, it won't happen, unfortunately. That's all right. Well, that's good to know um, in advance of the event. Um, Leslie, do you guys see video chats? 
Uh, so my colleague Eric prefers video, so he will always jump on when he's on uh, Brazen, but the rest of us uh, tend to just be, oftentimes we're handling multiple chats, is what you may not know, we're handling, mul answering multiple questions, and so it's it's challenging to do that if you're on video, because you want to just be able to uh, focus on the person that you're chatting with, so I guess I will leave it with, it depends on who you're talking to. All right. Um, would it be inappropriate for a candidate to request to come on video? What do you think, Leslie? I'm just asking from your perspective. Um, would that be like too forward or it would depend on the conversation? No, I don't think it hurts to ask. You know, it doesn't hurt to ask. The worst case, you're right back to where you already are, which is not on video. So I don't think it's yeah. going to be, I don't think it's going to be off putting. Okay, good. Yeah, good to know. I prefer video conversations. I find them just more productive because I can speak a lot faster than it's the back and forth. And to your point, you mentioned that you have uh, multiple conversations at a time when it's the text chat. So um, if you really wanted to command the attention of someone, there's only one video chat available at a time. So when you're on video, it's just one-to-one. -one, um, so you really get the full attention of both parties. All right, uh, uh, let's move on. We talked a lot about passion and um, connecting with the mission of the company. So what would you think is more important to a recruiter, the job seeker's specific skills or their personality? Or is it somewhere in between? Leslie, you want to start oh, It will be your skills and it will be your resume and it will get you through the front door. Once you get to the interview stage, it'll be a combination of both because the hiring manager will look at your skills, but also how do you interview? How do you interact with other people? Um, are you going to be a good fit culturally for the company itself? Okay. Leslie, I see you agreeing. Anything to add? Yes. Once it, the skills get you in the door, once you're in the door and you're having a conversation, then it's, you know, are you a good fit for the team? I completely agree. All right. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, Kathy, what education do the Wells Fargo typically require? Only about 2% of our positions will have a required education. Um, those will typically be our data analytics or quantitative analytics positions or our um, legal positions. The rest of our positions are very military friendly. So what you'll see is maybe five years of banking or financial services experience or five years of military experience. So we've really tried to incorporate military friendly language into 98% of our job descriptions. And there may be in the desired qualifications that we would like you to have a bachelor's degree or a master's degree. And that's the manager's wish list. It's not something that will make or break your resume. And so if you can demonstrate that you bring the other skills to the table and don't have those degrees, that's 100% okay. Okay, great. So experience and equal education, great. Um, and Leslie, in your recruiting experience, um, do you find more um, education requirements or is it similar to Wells Fargo? So I will just say I'm so proud to be partnered with Wells Fargo because that is our initiative. Uh, we started on Veterans Day with really honing in and substituting military experience in place of education. And we're gathering all of our corporate partners and we're talking about how to kind of change some of these processes. And Wells Fargo is, is our leader of that for substituting it for 98%. So I would just say that's the direction more and more companies and even states, um, you know, federal and state jobs are also heading that direction as well with recognizing that it, the experience uh, is just as valuable as a piece of paper. So, um, but I, I would say when you're when you're going through and searching, really look for if it says required or preferred. There's a difference there. If it's required, then it may be a deal breaker. But if it's just preferred, go for it. Yeah, I love that. And my husband's active duty right now, working on his bachelor's degree. So he's gonna be a little bummed when he finds out he didn't need to do it. <laughs> just kidding. Um, but on that note, we did learn that a lot of his military experience counted for credit for the college, so he's definitely getting a benefit there as well. Okay, um, so let's keep moving right along. Um, assuming the recruiter is interested in you, what would this next step likely be? Um, so, Kathy, you mentioned asking the recruiter 
um, outright, what is what are the next steps? Um, can you tell us a little bit about Wells Fargo's um, procedures? Absolutely. So if you were to come and join our job fair and come to our booth, um, you can have an active conversation with a military talent liaison, what we call our military recruiters on our team. And then within 48 hours, you'll receive a follow-up email from militaryrecruiting at wellsfargo.com, which you can also email us with any questions. And that will give you the opportunity to join our military talent community. And that will give me the opportunity to respond back and say, hey, let me connect you with a recruiter one-on-one -on -one to have that conversation to find out where you fit, what you're passionate about, how much money do you need to make, um, where do you want to live? And then they'll be able to help you through the recruiting process. Great, sounds reasonable enough. Okay, um, so once they've landed an interview, uh, what would your top piece of advice be to help make a positive impact in that interview? Uh, Leslie, do you wanna get this one? Research the company, understand their mission, understand their values. Um, are they publicly traded or not? But you'd be surprised how many people come to an interview and they don't know much about the position or the company. So do your di uh, due diligence. Really, again, you're not only saving the hiring manager and the recruiter's um, time, but you're also saving your own. So do that due diligence and research in advance. 100% agree. Anything to add to that, Kathy? I'd like to reiterate what you said earlier, Rachel, about looking at the job description for the position that you're applying for and picking out those key words and then making sure that you utilize those not only within your resume, but within your answers. So for a lot of roles, especially at Wells, we all of our questions will be based upon the job description itself. So if you see a customer service theme, you can almost guarantee you're going to have a customer service question. Or if it's some sort of an IT position, then you can see in the job description what they're looking for. Then you and most companies will use behavioral-based interview questions. So questions like, give me an example of a time when, um, and then you'll have to tell it in story form. So using the STAR interview technique, which you can see a lot of examples on YouTube or you can Google it, um, situation, task, action, result is a fantastic way to prepare for those interviews. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, and do you guys have any advice on what not to do in an interview? Obviously not vape. If it's virtual, don't be in your bed or in your jammies. <laughs> um, but what, something that we haven't mentioned, what would you suggest they steer away from? I would say, um, you know, stay away from distractions, background noise, interruptions, just talk to your family, you know, find a quiet space that you can focus, silence any notifications, leave your phone, leave your smartwatch out of the room. If it's in person, don't take it in with you because that's going to be, your smartwatch is going to be just as distracting or your phone going off, even in silence. That buzz, you know, that's it's distracting. So just try, you want them to focus on you and the talent and the skills that you bring to their organization, the value you bring to their organization and not be um, distracted by anything else. Yes, for sure. That's really great. Um, and just to add on to that, um, you mentioned like, you know, not having anything in your background if it's a virtual, um, like locking your pets out as well, because um, <laughs> there are so many times that my cat has to get locked out now because she would just jump right on the, the desk. But pets are handy because you can practice your elevator speech, you can practice your answers to questions. Um, your dog is going to be your biggest supporter, maybe right behind your mom, I don't know. But, um, you know, just practicing those questions in advance, um, like what Kathy was saying, there you can be assured that there will be customer service questions and you can do a quick Google search and find the most common, commonly asked questions. You know, it's always going to be, what was your worst experience? What would you have done better? You know, th those kinds of things. So be prepared um, and research what types of questions you can expect and then practice those answers, um, even if it's just in the mirror. Um, but if you mm -hmm. don't have a dog, I think you should go get one. And Rachel, the ACP mentors, they do mock interviews too. And sometimes they get a panel of um, a panel of colleagues and they go through, may, sometimes we even see them, they'll, they'll get their own hiring manager because maybe they don't have as much experience interviewing. So they'll get their own hiring manager and come in and do mock interviews. So, so definitely use a, a mentor for help, but practice, practice, practice. Yes, 
for sure. All right, um, so we have several questions in the chat. So um, I'm going to try and pick some of these out. I don't know if you guys have seen any as we've been talking. Um, uh, one question from social media, as far as resumes, how far back of job experience do recruiters in corporate America really want to see? Do they need to know that I was a waitress when I was in high school or no? <laughs> a really good question. Um, it depends on how much experience you have and if it's relevant. So if you are, you know, 10 years out and being a waitress is something that you're applying for now, then absolutely. But if you, um, you know, have 30 years of experience, we probably don't need to know what you did in high school. I say typically 20 years of experience is, if it's relevant, is what Wells Fargo likes to see and a lot of other financial institutions as long as it relates to the position that you're in now. Um, many companies will say keep your resume to one to two pages. For us, three is okay. To fit 20 years of amazing experience into two pages is really, really hard. So as long as it's not eight pages long for us, um, at three pages is probably max. But the common denominator, I believe, is around two. And I think that a really good place to go, again, is to ACP with your mentor. They can help you tailor that resume and leave in what's important to take out what is not. Okay, yeah. Um, and there should be, but you should be able to explain any gaps as well. I just wanted to address that. So if you've done something for two years and then come back to a different industry, or the same industry that was different, um, then I would suggest including it or at least um, addressing it in a cover letter or something like that. Yeah, great answer. Anything to add to that, Leslie? No, I would say relevance is always key. Um, All right. You wanna focus on what is relevant, what's transferable. And you know, if you have a really large graph that you need to address, there's different formats, like a combination, a, a way that us, you know, the time stamps aren't so glaring, but it's really more about the transferable skills. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, and this one's not related to Wells Fargo, I don't believe, um, uh, but the question is related to relevance and uh, resume. So, um, faxes asks us, what do you recommend for clearance level when your clearance is expired after leaving the military? but still clean enough to um, qualify for a new one if needed. So should they put on expired certifications or um, security clearance? What would you suggest? Wells does not have any positions that require a security clearance, but in general, um, I would say that you can put that on there. I don't know that it would be beneficial to the company other than knowing that maybe it expired two months ago, but you would still have to go through the lengthy process of getting that reinstated but yeah. knowing you had it before and it right. barely expired is probably good if it expired 10 years ago i don't think it should be on your resume mm -hmm. okay yeah. that's a yeah, great Leslie, point. You I, would say, I would say you know if anything it's almost like a character reference that you're able to obtain it and maintain it but like cassie said if it's 10 years ago then you know we don't know what that last 10 years looks like but it's very recent then just the ability to obtain and maintain one is it's almost like a character reference without making a phone call for sure yeah great insight so yes the verdict is yes include your security clearance if it is um recent um and then maybe not if it's 10 years old but um you could maybe allude to it in a cover letter or in an interview um, all right, um, somebody is asking, is publicly traded company good or bad? Anybody want to expand on that? Yes, it's up to the culture. And if you, you know, every, every publicly traded company too is going to be different. So even within the financial services industry, Wells is extremely different than USAA and Truist and USB. It really just depends on the company itself. Um, I've worked here for 13 years and I love it. However, I think working for a nonprofit would be absolutely fantastic as well. It just depends which nonprofit. All right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so just a personal preference. Yeah, um, I think you can't really box any organization in one way or the other. Just like you can't say all veterans are this or all spouses are this. You know, it's the same. All publicly traded companies are this or that. that you know, I think you just do your home from one company to the next, just, you know, talk to people on the inside, do your homework, look at their financial statements and do your due diligence. Yeah, for sure. And check out militaryfriendly.com. 
Well, Fargo's there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, I have another question from Michael. He's asking, um, it says, having gone through professional services and the statistics that 85% of job interviews acquired are through networking, um, what is the success rate of hires through the job fair? Um, so, uh, Cassie, can you speak to that just in Wells Fargo's um, experience in our job fair? Absolutely. So, I put this back on the job seeker themselves. You will receive a follow up email from probably most companies who visit their booth. Then the ball's in your court. If you follow up and you keep connecting with the recruiter, keep connecting with the military team if they have one then you are more likely to move forward. So I guess you could say that's a little bit of networking, but it's more being tenacious and following up and making sure that you are in front of them and doing all of the right things, right? Applying for the job, taking their advice when it comes to your resume, and then practicing for your interviewing skills. Awesome. Great. Um, okay. So... That is about it for our time. Um, there are some really great links in the chat. So please make sure that you are um, checking the chat before you log off. We have links in there to get a premium, a free premium LinkedIn account. We've got um, the ACP mentoring, a list of the companies that are in our um, virtual job fair, how to get to our job fair. Um, yeah, so uh, best of luck to you all. And we hope to see you in our event next week.